Thank you, Jeff, and good morning to those of you that are here. This is unusual for me. I'm not used to preaching to people, but uh, it's good to have some live bodies in front of me other than the three that have been here. And uh, good morning to all of you who are watching on the live stream. We are continuing our studies in um, Second Peter, and uh, we're coming to the end of our study. We're on this morning, it's Second uh, Peter 3, verses 1 through 9, and then next week we should, Lord willing, finish our study in this brief epistle. Peter writes, beginning in verse 1, This now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the word spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. By the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, what a blessing it is to be in Your house with Your people. We have a problem in the world, but more importantly, in the church. It was stated well by J.B. Phillips in a little book that he wrote over half a century ago, and the title says so much about that, and the title is, Your God is Too Small. That's the problem. Now, we expect that from the world of unbelievers, where if they even give a thought to God would dismiss him as irrelevant in this modern age of scientific discovery. But in the church, we would expect better. Yet as Mr. Phillips states at the beginning of his book, there are professing Christians with what he called childish conceptions of God. The problem is not only modern, it's ancient. The psalmist wrote about it. In Psalm 50, verse 21, the Lord speaks and He said, You thought that I was just like you. The accounts of their bad thoughts and behavior recorded in the psalm are the result of that. And it it is a childish concept of God that explains the lure, the attraction of the false teaching that Peter prophesied would occur when he wrote, 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 9. People will be enticed because their God is too small. Men will come along who will deny the Lord's return. In fact, they will mock the idea that that Christ is coming again. It's preposterous, they will say, even, even though it is promised in the Bible. We have it all through the Word of God. For example, in Titus 2, verse 13, Paul calls it the blessed hope and describes it as the appearing 
of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Peter said, men will come, scoffers, who will deny that. Deny it as something risible, laughable. And people will be duped into believing them because they don't understand that the Lord is who Paul said He is, our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. He is great, He is not small, and He is able. In Genesis 18, when God told Abraham, <clears throat> Sarah would have a son, Sarah laughed. And Lord, the Lord answered and said, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Now that is a rhetorical question, and the answer to that, of course, is no. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord, not even causing an old barren woman to give birth by means of a man who was beyond the age of producing children. And breaking into history again, coming to this world in power and glory as Christ promise to do is not too difficult for Him. Jesus Christ is our great God and Savior. So those who deny that commit heresy. Serious heresy. What Peter called in chapter 2 verse 1 destructive heresies. King James Version is close to the meaning with the translation damnable heresies. This heresy is damnable because it denies our hope, it undercuts the word of Christ and the apostles, and it's destructive of the Christian faith. So Peter now corrects it. He begins by stating the purpose of his letter. He was writing in order to stir up their minds, to alert them to the the danger of the false teaching, and to get them thinking correctly. He would do that by reminding them of things that had been previously taught by the Old Testament prophets, by the Lord, and by the apostles. The prophets spoke of the day of the Lord. The prophet Joel spoke of it in Joel chapter 2. It is a time of terror and judgment on the earth before the Lord returns. Christ spoke of His return and the, the kingdom to come in Matthew 19 verse 28. He called it the regeneration. Now that tells you something right there, that when He comes, there'll be a great change upon this earth. Amazing changes will take place. There will be a regeneration of the earth. That's how he describes the kingdom to come. When the Son of Man, he said, will sit on His glorious throne. So the Lord spoke of this. Spoke of it more often than just that. And Paul spoke of it in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The Old and New Testaments are filled with promises of the Lord's return. But in verse 3, Peter tells his readers that skeptics will come who deny all of that. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of His coming? Now, this is a prophecy. Peter wrote it in the future tense. Mockers will come. He wanted them to know this because we can learn a lot about the present by knowing the future. Time is moving toward an age of unbelief, of a rejection of biblical doctrine. Paul wrote similar warnings in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, and 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9. He described a time of widespread unbelief, uh, selfishness, and false teaching. In later times, he said, some will fall away from the faith. So it will be a time of great apostasy, of denying the truth. Now that's the the trajectory of this age, or the arc of this age. It's headed toward difficult times. And because it is the nature of this age, 
They weren't to be shaken when it happened in their own time. In 1 John 2, verse 18, just the, the next book over, John reminded people that Antichrist is coming. The, the beast, as he refers to him in the book of Revelation, the man of sin and lawlessness, as Paul speaks of him, this political religious figure that's, that's coming someday, is, is what he reminds them of. He's coming. But then he adds, even now many antichrists have appeared. Well, they've appeared because that's the nature of the age in which we live. And it was happening in the churches to which Peter wrote this letter. So he says, know this. There's nothing surprising about it. It is typical of this age. But be on guard and resist it, resist these men. Now, for us, 2,000 years later, Peter wrote this warning. After he wrote this warning, we see the same thing. We see the reality of everything that he's speaking of here. We're surrounded by these kinds of people. We're surrounded by skeptics. The idea that God will someday intervene in this world, break into history, is dismissed as naive, as mythological by the world, by the theological professors of many places. Their denials take the form of mockery. They ridicule a belief in the Lord's return. That's often the form an attack on the faith takes. Mockery. You saw that, you see that in Acts 17 when Paul is speaking to the Athenian philosophers and intellectuals. When he comes to the resurrection, they began to mock. They dismissed it. Well, that's what those who reject the faith and reject this particular doctrine do. And their rejection of it and their mockery of it is not grounded in fact. It's, it's cloaked in scorn, jeering. And that's what these men will do and what these men in Peter's day did. They mocked the truth of the second coming. But what drove their attack was not intellectual honesty or a quest for knowledge and truth, but their lust. That's what Peter says. They follow after their own lusts. Now, a, a man cannot follow after his lusts comfortably, knowing that he will pay a terrible price for the things that he does. And so men deal with that uncomfortable fact by denying it. Denying that there is a day of reckoning. Uh, they will do that in the future, Peter is saying. They do it today. They did it in Peter's time. It's what men do. Rather than abandon their sin, rather than repent and submit to God, they hold on to their sin and rationalize they quiet their conscience by mocking God and dismissing the Lord's return and end up believing their own lie. Now, they have a rational explanation for this. They have a rational way of explaining it, at least a kind of intellectual argument, and, and on one that on the face of it is sort of, Persuasive. It's realistic. That's the idea, at least. They're saying, let's look at reality. And Peter gives it in verse 4, their explanation in the question that they ask. Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And you can kind of feel the force of that question. Look around. This is reality, not some great intervention of the Lord. Uh, even in apostolic times, I think this, this question that they're really addressing was a concern. Because by the time Peter has written this letter, many Christians had died. And people that were hoping for the Lord's return might have begun to wonder, and I think they certainly did, where is His coming? 
1942, General Douglas MacArthur arrived in Australia. He had narrowly escaped from the Philippines, which had been captured by the Japanese army. MacArthur made a brief speech to reporters that ended famously with the line, I came through and I shall return. And it was a promise that he gave, and it gave hope to those that were there on the Philippines. And he did that victoriously in 1944. But you can imagine that over the months and the years of Japanese occupation, that some of the people there on the Philippines may have begun to, to doubt the general's promise and lose hope. Well, that it's not unlikely that that was something that was, was going on in these churches that Peter was writing to. Those churches in Asia Minor where these teachers had arisen and were questioning the Lord's return. And so that's why Peter is writing this in this second letter. They, they were living in occupied territory, as we are. The world is God's world. It's the place of His future kingdom. He is ruling, and yet at the same time it's a fallen world. And it presently lies in the evil one. John says that at the end of his first epistle. John, 1 John 5, verse 19. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He's the ruler of this world. Paul called him the God of this age. He has great power. And as the first generation of Christians began to die off, some in the church may have begun to wonder if, if the Lord's return was real, if this liberation was going to ever happen. And the false teachers were aggravating their doubts by scoffing at the promise. If it were going to happen, it would have happened. It hasn't happened because it's not going to happen. And they supported their skepticism by describing the world and history as unchanging. Since the fathers, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Look, great convulsive events that change the world. God coming, that doesn't happen. When have you ever seen something like that happen? Never. Events like the second coming don't occur. That's not reality. That's what they're saying. And you look at life and yeah, it just doesn't happen. It's one day after another. Now that's what they were saying. If, if it's what we hear today from those who believe in naturalism or materialism, the world is a closed system, God doesn't intervene, there, there's no room for the supernatural, God is not governing history, the universe is an impersonal place uh, of, of matter and physical laws. It's just a big machine. It came into existence by chance. In modern times, this is known as uniformitarianism. Only natural processes work in, worked in the past, and those same processes are working today. Nothing has changed, nothing's going to change. And of course, there's some truth in that. There are not great disruptions in the natural world. Not normally. Things do continue as they have in the past, and, and we rely on that. That's the goodness of God to us. It's His care for His creation through His providence. Things do function according to natural law. There is consistency. That's why we can do science. But natural law is God's law. It is the means through which He consistently works to sustain the world that He has created. And He can interrupt things to bring about His will as he wills to do it. He rules. The heretics didn't believe that, and the evidence they gave is the continual routine of life. Rather than see the faithfulness and the goodness of God in that, they saw the absence of God in it. 
So Peter answers these men in verses 5 through 7 and exposes the weakness of their argument. They forgot about the flood. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Now, Peter said, at least as it's put in the New American Standard Bible, it escapes their notice. But uh, this wasn't a mere mistake, just an oversight on their part. The Greek text has the word willing. So they were not only neglecting this, they were willingly, deliberately ignoring it. False teachers do that. They use Bible verses that they think support their position and ignore those that don't. Peter called them out on this. What about Genesis 6, he's saying? What about the flood? It covers three chapters in the Bible, Genesis 6 through 8. Well, what's so important about the flood? What's important about it is these teachers said everything from the creation from the beginning is the same. Uniformitarianism. Nothing changes. It seems they viewed the world as, uh, as self-sustaining and self-directed, just, just following the laws of nature that govern it. God is like an absentee landowner. He doesn't intervene. We're on our own. The flood shows that is not true. The creation of the universe, of this world, shows that that is not true. God is sovereign over it. He created it by His world, His Word. He, he created it by divine fiat. He spoke it all into existence when there was nothing. And He cares about it. He brought dry land out of the water that covered the earth. He made the world inhabitable. And He sustains it by water. He is involved in this world. He is involved in its origin and continuance. But then, He used the water that was part of the world's origin and preservation to destroy it. So, read the Bible, He's saying to these people. You claim to be teachers and theologians of the Lord God. Read His Word. The lessons of the creation and the flood are there. And those lessons are moral. We do not live autonomous lives. That is, we do not li live independent, self-directed lives. We are dependent creatures. God is sovereign. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of everything. And he is also the judge. He's patient. He tolerates sin, but not forever. And when his patience runs out, he intervenes in human affairs. The flood proves that. He did that. And he can do it again. And he will. That's what Peter states in verse 7. It will be in a different way from the first time. In the future, it will be by fire. But by His Word, the present heavens and earth are being preserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Throughout Scripture, both water and fire are symbols for for judgment and for purification. The world of Noah was cleansed of sin when God drowned it. Our world will end when God burns it. He will sweep it all away and with it ungodly men. Peter says the world is reserved for that. Literally, it has been treasured up for it. That's a, a figurative way of saying it has been set apart or destined for judgment. The, the end of the world as we know it is certain. 
Now that should give us perspective on life. Things won't last forever. It's foolish to build for this world. Time will run out on it. And it will all go up in flames. But they also needed God's perspective on things. On time itself. We do. We need that perspective. And God's perspective on time is not like ours. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. That is a quote from Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years, meaning he can accomplish in one day what it takes man a thousand years to do. And a thousand years is like a day to him. That second line is for the false teachers. A thousand years to him is like a day, just a moment. So... The fact that the promise wasn't fulfilled in less than 50 years after the Lord ascended into heaven, having promised to return, well, that was no reason to doubt the validity of his promise because from God's perspective, only part of the day had passed. And even for us, some 2,000 years later, the, the Lord, after the Lord left with that promise of returning, it's only two days on God's calendar. What seems like a long time to us is only a brief moment to God. God's not bound by time as we are. Time is His creation. Before He made time, God always was. He has no beginning, has no end. He's not like us and doesn't calculate things the way we do. Again, one of the failures of the false teachers and also those Christians who were beginning to be influenced by their ideas and, and their ridicule is their idea of God was too small. It's a childish conception He's not bound by time or space. He doesn't live under the constraints of someone's schedule. In fact, the Lord is the one who makes the schedule. That's the picture given to us in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, where the writer says that through Christ, God made the world. That is literally, He made the ages. He makes time. He makes each age an epoch of history. Then he writes in verse 3 that Christ upholds all things by the word of His power, which literally is He is carrying or bearing along all things by the word of His power. He, he's unfolding history. He's moving time and events and the world on their course. The schedule he is on is one that he has planned. That's the triune God. He is infinite. That's no small God. The fifth evangelist, Isaiah, spoke often of God's greatness. In chapter 40, he describes the Lord as enthroned above the vault of the earth. And below, he says, we're like grasshoppers. Well, that was from Isaiah's perspective. If he had a more modern science, had the microscope, he might have said, and we are like amoebas. The earth, the universe, he goes on to say, is like a speck of dust on his scales. That is a great God, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Then in Isaiah 57, verse 15, is this very personal description. Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place and also 
with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He dwells in a high place. He dwells outside this world, outside the universe. And yet, and yet he comes down to the obscure places and dwells with us to comfort us, to comfort the beaten down and the discouraged. God's not limited. People make a gross miscalculation when they think that He is like them, that He is like us. That's a, that is an error that wrecks faith. It wrecks faith. God is sovereign and merciful. And because He is sovereign and merciful, He can and does keep His promises. He's faithful. But in order to believe that, we must understand how great God really is. He is infinite and eternal and unchangeable and mighty. We need that perspective. We cannot, he cannot be frustrated in his purposes. And we need to understand that as well. He is an unfrustratable God. He has a purpose. He is acting according to it. It is His plan of salvation. That's the reason the Lord has not yet come. And Peter explains that in verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, the Lord is not running late. He's not like us. Everything is moving smoothly and timely according to His plan. He's being patient right now because He does not want any to perish. Now what does that mean? This is often cited as proof that Christ died for everyone, all without exception. Or it's cited as proof of universal salvation, that 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 everyone who has ever lived or will live will be saved. None will perish. William Barclay, the popular liberal commentator, saw in that what he called this statement in uh, verse 9, what he called the glint of a larger hope of the universal salvation of the whole world. So it's proof of universalism. Neither of those ideas is supported by the passage. In fact, both ideas make nonsense of, of the verse. Universalism is, is denied by verse 7, which prophesies doom for unbelievers. The earth is kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. So, if Christ's return... Uh, uh, it awaits the repentance of every individual without exception, then Christ will never return. But God is patient with the wicked. We see that very clearly in numerous texts, but we see it, for example, in Ezekiel 18, verse 32, where he says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. He says it again, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants them to repent and live. But not all do. So not all are saved. Universalism is not taught anywhere in the Bible, not here or anywhere else. It, it doesn't fit the broader context of this passage or the immediate one. God's patience is not with the wicked, at least not here in this text. It is with His people. That's what Peter says. He is patient toward you, toward believers. That's the you of verse 1, the beloved, and it's the same in verse 8. That's that the context is about you. And he's explaining the identity of the all. Not, and I should say that explains the identity, uh, the identity of the all here. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That is not wishing for any of you, not wishing for the church to perish. So God's not willing for any of His people to perish. That's what He's saying. He's referring to His elect, all of those He has chosen through the ages. 
He is presently gathering His people out of each generation. God is following His plan. The scoffers didn't understand that. If, if He had sent His Son, though, after His ascension into heaven, immediately after it, midway, say, through the first century, what would have happened to the elect of the second century? Or the second millennium? He would have preempted His plan of salvation for generations of Christians. It is God's plan to save all of His elect who are placed in a long series of generations. He knows how many. We don't. We do know this. It is a vast multitude of people. And with the salvation of each soul, we draw closer to that day. But Christ won't return until the last of His chosen ones are gathered in. This is a testimony to the love of God and His patience. Because each generation is corrupted with sin and deserving of God's immediate wrath. He knows it. He sees it. Just as He did in the days of Noah. Genesis 6 verse 5 says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that led to the flood. It's not any different today. But God is patient toward you, toward His church, toward His nation Israel. He hasn't sent His Son to judge the world because of you. He endures the wickedness that He sees for our sake. So to the church, Peter is saying, don't be discouraged by the wait. It's not a delay. Christ will come. God isn't slow about His promise. He's following a plan. His plan is for us in the present time to preach the truth, to give the gospel, and to live it, to live a life consistent with it. He has given us an opportunity in this time to do that. To be lights in the midst of a dark world. And His agents in gathering His people through the teaching of the Gospel. We give it generally. We don't know who the elect are, but we know they're there. And we know He's gathering them. And He uses us to do that. And He's giving us opportunities in this day and age to do that. And at the same time in doing that, He is giving us opportunities to prepare ourselves for heaven and the glory of the kingdom to come. In spite of the sophisticated denials of the skeptics, Christ will come again in power and might as He promised he will judge the wicked and He will establish His millennial kingdom on earth. And all of these great events of the future will be inaugurated by the rapture of the church, which Paul talks of in 1 Thessalonians 4. That may happen at any time. And that should motivate us to obedience in the present time. But all of this should alarm the unbeliever and cause him or her to wake up to the peril of his or her soul. God is the Almighty. He rules and will judge ungodly men, Peter says. The judgment is certain and the judgment is eternal. It is the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. But God who is just is also merciful. And He has given time for people to come to repentance. So come. Christ died on the cross in the place of sinners and His sacrifice is sufficient for all. And that includes you if you're one who has not yet put your faith in Christ or those who may be listening. Look to Him. Don't delay. Believe whoever you are Receive forgiveness and eternal life. Become an heir of the kingdom and live with that blessed hope of the Lord Jesus Christ's glorious return. May God help you to do that. I'm going to close in prayer and then following 
the hymn that we will have, we will again observe the Lord's Supper. So let's bow together in prayer, prayer and ask the Lord to bless the time we've had together and, and then our remembrance of Him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for the hope that we have that's set forth here by the Apostle Peter. He reminds us of the the great hope that we have that is questioned by the skeptics of our day, that were was questioned by the false teachers of his day, and will be questioned in the end, at the end of the age, by the false teachers that will come. And we can become in somewhat affected by what is said. Keep us from that. Protect us from that. Help us to remember your promises are sure. You're not coming on our schedule. You have a perfect schedule. And, and it's being worked out presently in this present time at this very moment. And we have this great hope of your son coming and righteousness and justice being established on the earth and a glorious kingdom to come. We have the hope of the new heavens and the new earth, of a world without end, of eternity, of glory and joy and blessing. And we have all of that because of what your son did for us on the cross. So Lord, we thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for sending him to die for us, for gaining forgiveness and eternal life for us. And now, Lord, as we will reflect upon that with the Lord's Supper, we pray that you would bless us and prepare our hearts for that. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are gathered here remotely and in person to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We are celebrate, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper, as Christians have been doing since the time of Christ. Believers came together for the ministry of the world, for the Lord's Supper, and prayer as Luke writes in the book of Acts, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord Jesus, he stands here and tells us that he gave himself for us. He shed his blood, he gave his life. And we come to this table, not that the Lord will give his life or shed his blood again, but for us to remember what he has done once and for all, and a promise that he will return. Until then, do this in remembrance of me, he said. We are not bringing any good works and no human good works, no merit, anything good at all to this table. He wrote in, John wrote in chapter 15, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. We believe because the Holy Spirit called us to trust and have faith in him. We want to understand the depth of the sacrifice 
which we will never fully understand the greatness of what Christ did on the cross. But I think in John 1, we get a kind of a glimpse of his greatness. In the beginning was the world, and the world was with God, and the world was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the life of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was from the beginning. He was with God. He is God. He, the creator of heavens and earth and the great shepherd of the sheep, asks us to do this in remembrance of him. What a pleasure it is to come to the Lord's Supper every week and remember him. And as we take of the bread, we are spiritually fed by the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit in our meetings. So if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether here or at home, we invite to share with us the partaking of the elements. Before I give thanks for the bread, when the elements are passed, we will do it a little bit differently. The deacons will actually give you a little cup with the bread. You take the entire cup and keep it. And when the wine is passed, you take the wine as always, and you please keep the cups. You do not need to return, it to, return them to the container. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in thankfulness for the love and grace you have given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. And that he willingly, as the unblemished Lamb of God, was crucified for our transgressions. We thank you for sending your Son to proclaim, proclaim the good news on earth, as prophesied in the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We were blind, Father, but now by your grace we can see, and we thank you. Help us to live lives of obedience and truth and love. And we also pray that we'll be able to stand up to the world and proclaim the truth until you return. We praise you, Lord, that we can bow down before you, confessing our sins, knowing that there is no sin in us for which the blood of Jesus Christ didn't fully and completely pay for. We pray that we will take this bread in a worthy manner to your glory. Amen. Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. A few things to notice here. First, Christ is the Son of Man. It's a popular designation that he gave himself throughout the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It speaks of his human nature. He was, is a real man with a true body and a reasonable soul. But it's also a messianic title. It's taken from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, where one like the Son of Man is seen in heaven coming to the Ancient of Days to receive a kingdom. So it also speaks of his heavenly origin. And that too is suggested by the statement that he came. In other words, he left heaven to come here, and he came here on a mission, and that mission was to be a ransom. A ransom is a payment that's made to free captives or slaves. I think we've talked about that important word before, and 
And here he did it for many, for a multitude of lost sinners that the Father had given him to redeem. It speaks of his abundant grace because it is a, a number that he told Abraham would be like the stars of the heaven or the sand of the sea on the seashore or the dust of the earth. Literally, the statement, a ransom for many, is a ransom in the place of many. He became our substitute in judgment. That's how he paid the ransom. That's how he gained our freedom, our salvation, with his own life and blood. It set us free. It made us children of God with a glorious inheritance in the world to come. And we're to remember that as we take the cup and recall His blood, His sacrifice for us, and what He paid to gain that for us. But there's a context to this statement. There was a, a heated discussion among the disciples about who would be great in the kingdom. Who would sit next to Christ on his right and on his left? And Jesus, hearing this argument between them, this indignant argument that they were engaging in, told them the way to greatness. And the way to greatness is service. Verse 27, And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. And then he gave himself as the great example of that. That's why he said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He ransomed us in order to gain forgiveness for us, to free us, not only to be with him in glory for all eternity, but He gained our freedom for us. He gained new life for us so that we could serve one another now in love. And that too is what we need to remember as we take the cup. In his Freedom of a Christian Man, Martin Luther wrote, A Christian is a most free Lord of all, subject to none, a Christian is a most dutiful servant of all, subject to all. May the Lord teach that to us, and may the Lord make servants of each one of us for one another. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we do thank You for what this cup represents the sacrifice that Your Son made for us, what a cost that was to gain our freedom, to redeem us, to ransom us out of slavery to sin, and to make us Your children and give us a glorious inheritance, but also to make us new creatures in this world so that we would live differently. And rather than live like the world and seek to be number one in everything, we would now have a different perspective and seek to be servants of one another. May we gain that perspective and may we have that desire. We thank you that your Son, the eternal Son of God, the one through whom this world was created, willingly became a creature, became a man, became a human being in order to die for us and to gain everything for us. We thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that concludes our service again for this week. And may I say, it really is a pleasure to see your faces here. Uh, it's been too long. And I look forward to seeing more next week. Let's give thanks for our time together and ask the Lord's blessing upon us for the week. Father, we do pray that. We I thank you for this time together. It's great to be together again with fellowship with your saints. and. We pray that as we continue to open up, things will go smoothly. Bless us throughout the week. Keep us healthy. Keep us active. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that we have in Him. It's in His name we pray. Amen.
Keep looking to him. Bye.